Hello everyone and welcome once again to this very special event which is part of the series of talks celebrating the 175th anniversary of the birth of French spiritist philosopher Leon Denis. Today we are joined by Umberto Schubert who will be talking about spiritism in the arts. Now, this event has been organized by the British Union of Spiritist Societies, BAS, and is being streamed on both the YouTube and Facebook channels of BAS, as well as by the Irish Spiritist Federation, Kardec Radio, and Kardec Group. So please make sure you give a thumbs up, like, and share this event, and don't forget to follow and subscribe to these channels too. And please let us know where you're watching from so we can say hello to you. Now stick around with us until the very end because we will have a few announcements from BUS as well as a Q&A with Umberto. So let's introduce our guest. Umberto Schubert is a philosopher and lecturer at the Federal University of Juiz de Fora in Brazil. He is a spiritist writer contributing to various projects, including Projeto Alan Kardec from the same university. Umberto is also coordinating a series of philosoph philosophical studies about the works of Leon Denis, and the videos of these are on the YouTube channel of the Spiritist Society of Bournemouth. Now, if that wasn't enough, Umberto is also a co-host with myself and Annie Sinclair on the Kardec Group podcast, Insightfully Speaking. Now, Umberto's lecture today is quite interesting, so if you have any questions, please send them in the comments or chat box, and we will read them out later. But please note we can only see your comments or questions if you are putting them on the channels of BAS, the Irish Federation, Kardec Radio, or Kardec Group, and if you send them during the live event itself. So let's get started and bring on Umberto. Hello, Umberto. How are you? Hello, Adam. It's a renewed privilege and pleasure to cooperate with you. Yeah, it's always a pleasure to have you around in any of the events. So, what can you tell us about spiritism in the arts? Well, first, I would like to thank you for the invitation. I would also like to thank Elsa Rossi for the, the first contact uh, about this uh, speech. And uh, I would like to emphasize that uh, Leon Denis is uh, one of the greatest authors in uh, the field of spiritist philosophy, also one of the first great authors. And uh, even uh, outside the reach of uh, spiritist philosophy, he was in his own time a very influential author and thinker and, and speaker uh, in uh, the sense of um, the moral uh, solace and, and support to those who lost uh, the entire families in the First World War or in a pandem pan pandemic uh, a crisis uh, in the early 20th century. Well, I will start uh, sharing my presentation. Please tell me if it's uh, working correctly. Can you see yep. it? I think we should be able to see it now. Okay. Well, um, spiritism in the arts is also much about beauty. Uh, as Alain Kardec, Leon Denis is a philosopher, a, a popular writer also, and a mystic, we could say, in the positive sense of the word that is much concerned with the idea of beauty. And uh, he's also committed to preserve the classical idea of beauty. As we can see in this picture, the classic uh, idea of beauty or the classic concept of beauty has something to do with uh, the relationship between man and God. But uh, this is not a symmetrical relationship since God is always trying to, to reach us, to touch us, as you can see in the right uh, part of this, this picture, uh, because uh, God's uh, finger is stretched in our direction. Uh, on the other hand, uh, man's finger 
seems to us a, a bit lazy, a bit reluctant, and it's up to us to choose to touch God or not, or to remain uh, in our isolation, or consequently in our pain, in, in our suffering, in our solitude. Uh, we can also see this picture as uh, a, a picture of the duality of beauty from the side of God and from uh, the perspective of man. Uh, from God's perspective, uh, beauty is also uh, granted. It is already there in nature. And wherever we, we look to nature, we see beauty in the starry heaven and in, in the sky, uh, in, in the oceans, in, in the mountains, in the deserts, in, in the woods, everywhere uh, beauty is present in our world. But uh, when we move to humanity, it is also a matter of choice if we are going to produce beautiful things or not. And this is a key part of uh, Denise's understanding of aesthetics and of art. Art is an act of freedom and it is to some extent dependent on the will of, of the man, which is not uh, as stable and as uh, universal as the will of God. So uh, we could say that uh, human art can always choose to be beautiful and to reflect uh, divinity or not. It can also choose to remain in the realm of uh, uh, animal uh, concerns or basic social concerns or in the realm of political acts or even uh, we can also choose to make absolutely no art at all. It is also uh, in our choice. Well, uh, to understand the classical concept of beauty, it is mandatory to come back to Plato. Plato was the creator of the classical concept as a concept, but uh, he pretty much uh, gathered some uh, preconceptions of the, the Greek civilization of the time. Uh, for Plato, as we may know, uh, beauty is a form of apprehension of the good. Plato speaks much about the good more than uh, about beauty, but when he speaks about beauty, he, he shows to us a sort of uh, reverence, a, a sort of um, worship to the idea of beauty, as beauty was one of the divine attributes as it was part of what we call God or the sacred. So it is something uh, that we cannot remove from our lives and from our culture without immediately suffering uh, huge consequences, huge negative consequences, because uh, beauty is also uh, the best part uh, of us, the best part of our souls. And in, in the Phaedros, for example, Plato said that the souls that are morally uh, superior, they are more perfect in themselves, they are used to, uh, or they are familiar to uh, the gods or the, the sphere of, of the divine. And because of that, uh, moral or wise souls or persons, they are used to uh, the constant contemplation of the divine things. And this constant contemplation also enlightens and uh, embellishes or improves the, the beauty in their souls, uh, in themselves. So um, we do not admire bad things for Plato. And this also means we do not praise, we never praise inadequacy, irrationality, disorder, and uh, chaos. 
Uh, a very good example of that is waste. Plato here and then gives this uh, example. It's a recurrent example, as in the text Parmenides, for example. Um, Plato says, well, waste is the ultimate form of ugliness because it has no purpose, it has no specific form. It is actually the fragmentation and the, the brick uh, of form. And uh, from uh, a beautiful apple or from uh, a beautiful tree or from a, a beautiful uh, vase, we, uh, after destruction, we come to, as a result, we come to a sort of um, pointless uh, pile of objects. And that uh, pile of waste uh, arises a very specific disgust in us because it has no meaning, it has no sense. And because we cannot uh, understand it as something that has meaning, that has a, a recognizable form, we just reject this pile of waste as uh, useless and uh, ugly. There is no good in, in waste, so to say. Well, uh, as a conclusion, we could say that for Plato, beauty is not the apprehension in the more uh, sensual sense, but it is the intellectual apprehension of the proper forms of things. So it is a very demanding concept, very specific, but it is also the concept that worked very well for at least 2,300 years until more or less the end of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th, when we start challenging the concept of beauty and uh, even the concept of art. And uh, we started uh, thinking about a non-concept of art or a, a so flexible concept that we could include basically everything. And uh, it, it turned out very badly, it didn't uh, turn out well, because we ended up with uh, no reference and no criteria. And many of us can very quickly realize that in some artistic presentations of uh, our days, we uh, have completely pointless, random and definitively ugly objects that uh, people try to to present as art and uh, expect us to to pay uh, an indecent amount of money for them now uh, still uh, in the line of plato we can see in this um, kale leaf a sort of order that has to do with mathematical symmetry it is not perfect symmetry, but uh, symmetry is pretty much there. Uh, it, it's possible to visualize some balance and some sort of correspondence from one side to uh, the other. And this is not uh, only a, a matter of good engineering, but it is also a way to uh, capture and to represent in, in one picture the idea of order, the idea of uh, organization, of intrinsic uh, driving forces that are in themselves uh, organized and we could even say with Plato, rational, because it's rational, because it's ordered, or because it's balanced in harmony, we immediately identify this leaf as beautiful. Now, when we see a uh, rotten or destroyed leaf of the same plant, we are and we are seeing the, the same material, the basic molecular and even cellular components of that leaf 
but uh, because symmetry is not there anymore, we do not see that as beautiful anymore. People uh, will very rarely judge uh, semi-destroyed flowers or leaves as uh, still beautiful, or equally beautiful as the ones that we call perfect because they are in their proper form or because they uh, hold some sort of intrinsic balance and intrinsic symmetry or rational order. Uh, this is what Plato calls the form or the idea of the things. Everything is essentially a material uh, reflect reflection of uh, a specific idea. The idea of leaf, for example, is here uh, absent. We have the same matter, we have may have the same cells, and from a uh, nutritive, uh, nutritious point of view, we may even have the same vitamins and, and proteins and, and carbohydrates, and it could be as food um, still good, but uh, it is nevertheless very ugly because the order is now broken. Well, uh, this tells us a lot about the physical idea of beauty, but not so much about moral beauty, spiritual beauty, or even the more subtle beauty of uh, works of art that include uh, human relationships and human dramas. In order to understand this uh, other level or this other layer of beauty in reality, we need to understand that for Plato, it is still related to the idea of order. So what is morality, for example? What is virtue? What is uh, reason? What is uh, prudence and decency and dignity? Uh, they are all resumed as a way of putting order in our life. So uh, a life full of order, of balance, of uh, uh, structure is uh, more intellectual. It is more spiritualized and intellectualized in the very positive sense that uh, the works of Alan Kardec give to, to the word uh, uh, spiritualized and intellectualized. And one of the main uh, tasks of the spirits on earth, uh, and I'm, I'm not talking about deceased spirits, I'm, I'm talking about us as uh, incarnated uh, spiritual agents. One of our main tasks is to improve this world towards perfection of the forms, toward the intellectualization of matter, to give uh, order and to structure matter as best as possible. And of course, it involves reducing waste and recycling, but also improving our architecture, urban environment, or even uh, our countryside environment or our, our fields. Well, uh, in resume, I will briefly uh, read for you this part. Blaiso thought that the intellect or the spirit is permanent, while material forms are transitory, evanescent. They just fade away. So uh, even if material forms are for a brief moment, beautiful. This uh, moment uh, is, it will pass somewhere, and what remains is uh, a pile of waste or a pile of uh, material of component that has no meaning uh, anymore and therefore no uh, beauty in itself anymore. Well. Material forms and physical beauty, uh, including the, the beauty of 
people or animals are destined to vanish, while wisdom, virtue, moral good, moral excellence, uh, competence, we could also say, never fade away. If we possess spiritual beauty, it remains with us, with us throughout life and after. This is why uh, as much as, as Jesus, uh, Plato stressed, according also to his master Socrates, that we should invest most of our time perfecting our souls and not our bodies, not our financial life, or not uh, our careers or our reputation in the more material sense of this world, but we should invest in our souls and our spirits because they remain, they, they will be with us uh, after decades and even after death. So he believed. So uh, which the most beautiful thing uh, that exists? It is the beautiful soul, because even if material objects can be beautiful and they are beautiful, usually they are beautiful because they have a, a semblance of eternal ideas that guide them. And we, we see a, a horse that is not a corpse of a horse, but a, a living horse running. And we, we praise this horse and we, we call it beautiful because it uh, inspire us and it remember us of the idea of an organized creature fulfilling its purpose. But when we remove uh, the soul of the horse or the form of the horse, the matter, the flesh that constitutes it will uh, very quickly uh, disappear in a very disformed and therefore ugly uh, figure. So the most beautiful thing is uh, necessarily uh, a beautiful soul, a soul that possesses knowledge and virtue and that acts uh, in a more atemporal way as the gods do. Well, um, let us reflect about these pictures for a couple of seconds. We, we have here images that may make us smile. Very few people would cry seeing these pictures. Uh, it is a very beautiful plate of fruits and a, a very beautiful picture of uh, flowery bushes. Uh, and uh, the, the woman is also not only beautiful in herself, but she's smiling. And because she's smiling, it, uh, sh she produces uh, in, in our hearts an idea of joy, of harmony, of um, rest, that, uh, of relaxation that helps us to also feel good. Well, this is uh, the very picture of physical or material beauty. It is something that uh, stimulates our sense of pleasure, of adequacy, of uh, good proportion. But when we come to moral beauty, to intellectual beauty, things are not always so. And instead of smiling, we may be moved to, to tears. Sorry. Uh, this is Caravaggio, uh, Peter's crucifixion. And at the bottom, we have a picture of Mother Therese with uh, many children, uh, which uh, he, he took care for. And these are not pictures that would usually uh, produce in us or stimulate in us a smile, a sensation of joy in the ordinary sense of this word. 
but uh, many people after long contemplation of uh, Caravaggio's Peter crucifixion could uh, actually drop some tears and and feel sad or when we see uh, these extraordinary human beings that uh, care about others and act charitably uh, to others, we are many times uh, reflective and we may even feel bad about uh, ourselves, about uh, uh, how little we, we do uh, for the others, how little we care about the others, about our own indifference uh, or lack of empathy or lack of uh, engagement and maybe because of that maybe just because it is something very deep and the the material the, the concrete acts of love move a very deep part of our souls maybe because of that we may cry now uh, Plato will say moral uh, beauty is not always as joyful and as pleasant as uh, physical beauty but uh, we also recognize in these more intense pictures a sort of sadness or drama that can produce a higher uh, feeling, a higher idea or a higher experience of beauty now uh, we are now in, in Easter and it's very adequate to remember uh, of crucifixion and uh, the joyful moment of resurrection of the, the encounter between uh, Mary uh, Magdalene and uh, Jesus and uh, it, it is absolutely normal and even expected that it moves us to tears when we come to another uh, unmatched mind, a uh, paragon of reason and understanding of, and, and intelligent Aristotle, we have a more um, evolutive or progressive concept of beauty. Because uh, for Aristotle also, beauty is the apprehension of uh, the good but not an essential apprehension of the good as for Plato, but the apprehension of the goodness that moves a thing forward. And uh, it is a very evolutive uh, idea uh, that basically is connected to the perfection, the flourishing or the improvement, the developing of everything when we move from the potential or the promise to uh, the full realization of something, be it uh, an intellectual process, an artistic process, or an object like a seed that becomes uh, a plant and a plant that produces flowers. In this uh, phenomena, in this process of uh, evolution, from uh, the potential promise to uh, the full realization, the, the fulfillment of something's uh, uh, purpose or something uh, of the goal of a thing. In this process, we identify uh, goodness for Aristotle. And when we identify this sort of goodness, we also identify beauty. It is pleasant to us, it is inspiring, it is admirable to see something flourishing, something coming to its full potential, realizing its full potential. So uh, comparing, uh, compared to Plato, it's a more progressive vision and Aristotle sees beauty uh, in the becoming, not uh, in the thing, uh, as an already appropriate form. Well, uh, finally, we come to Leon Denis, but we still have to remark that Leon Denis is also 
a casual reader of the religious traditions. Uh, Spiritism is not a religion, but uh, it has much to do with religion uh, in the sense that uh, according to to the historian Lin Sharp, Spiritism is a sort of secular spirituality. Is, uh, it is a philosophical way of interpreting spiritual phenomena or religious phenomena and uh, giving it a uh, philosophical clothing, a, a sort of uh, philosophical glue uh, for this phenomena. Well, uh, but Allah Kardec and also Leon Denis believed that it was uh, our task as spiritists to understand the religious traditions of uh, mankind as uh, attempts of the divine or attempts of uh, the, the superior spirits to communicate or to share their values, their perspectives, their wisdom with us. So it may occur through the teachings of the greatest uh, founders of religions, uh, as the example of Jesus and, and, and Buddha pretty well show, or it could uh, happen through more mundane uh, mediums, uh, which are the prophets and everyone basically that is not uh, exactly a, a teacher of humanity, for humanity, sent by God, but uh, someone that uh, had uh, or has here and there uh, an insight and an inspiration that could be converted to um, to wisdom or to, to some fruitful or, and useful uh, teaching to us. Well, when analyzing the Bible or the Celtic religion, the Druidic religion that uh, Leon Denis worships and, and, and loves, we can see that uh, there is also uh, much poetry and lyricism in the way that the old religions describe divine reality and mixing the classical idea from Plato and Aristotle with this more concrete, poetical, aesthetical insight of the religions. Uh, Leon Denis builds in his own poetry because he is a very uh, lyrical writer. He he is very, uh, he's much concerned with the aesthetics of his own texts and, and of his own speeches. Uh, when, when we read him and when we contemplate his uh, works, we will see that he uh, tries to involve us in an atmosphere of beauty. And he also sees beauty not only in the arts, as we are going to talk uh, about briefly, uh, but he also sees beauty in nature everywhere. When he speaks about uh, the great mystery or the great enigma in the world, uh, he uh, aestheticizes or he uh, lyricizes uh, all his speech and uh, he presents us a picture where the insects and the grains of dust and the dead leaves uh, on the ground uh, in the middle of the woods and basically everything has uh, a form of beauty or uh, deserves to be admired, to be respected in some sense. So it is a deeply ecological understanding of the world, understanding of life, if we could uh, use a slightly anachronistic uh, concept, but I think it is, uh, it is rather fair to, to use the, 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 the word uh, ecological view of the world and also a very religious view of the world. Well, uh, that's much in the line of Plato or Augustine. Augustine also says in, uh, in his Confessions 
that uh, uh, we should never hate or despise anything because uh, anything that we disgust or that we hate or that we despise was actually made by God. And when God made it, when God made this thing that we despise, that disgusts us or that we uh, do not admit, uh, God not only made it for a purpose, but also enjoyed this being, this creature of, of, of it, of it, of him. So uh, everything and everyone, even in pain or in struggle, even in difficulty, is either either physically or morally beautiful or both. Now we move to the central point of the book, Spiritism in the Arts. What is art? We spoke uh, about beauty and uh, how the classical concept of beauty is very demanding. And uh, we also say that Leon Denis' concept of beauty is the classical concept and maybe even uh, more demanding uh, than the classical concept of building itself. Uh, and therefore, it has consequences for art. Leon Denis will not think that everything is art very in, uh, in contrary to, to modern uh, artists, museums, presentations, and society in general. Uh, he believes that art includes excellence, includes the perfection of forms, and uh, most of all, art includes uh, a sort of uh, direct direction of our vision to the divine. It is raising our heads to the stars, to the infinity, to the absolute, and try to contemplate uh, the greatness of, of God itself. But again, God uh, for Denis is not an alien figure. It, it is everywhere. It is in nature. It is inside us. So when we reflect the beauty of things, we are also reflecting the beauty of God. We may uh, depict uh, that nature or uh, human uh, scenes or uh, we may speak about feelings and sentiments or about uh, very concrete uh, social happenings and it is uh, all very fine very well because uh, whenever we are uh, envisioning uh, reality we are somehow also addressing the absolute cause of everything or the primary cause of everything. Well, for Leon Denis then, uh, true art cannot manifest the bad. This is the only thing that art cannot do. It cannot manifest the bad, nor can it come from a bad soul, uh, someone that is disturbed or uh, in, in in a, a struggles or someone that is uh, in in conflict with others can very hardly produce the higher works of art. We usually say we we like to say in a dramatized version of the history of the art that artists are um, souls in conflict and that. Uh, endure many struggles and, and many pains, and that's true, but uh, they are not uh, as unbalanced and as disturbed as we may think, because uh, it, art also involves technical excellence, which is pretty demanding. It's pretty demanding in terms of time and investment and, and patience, and it is impossible for a dysfunctional soul to invest uh, a lot of energy and time and years of practice to perform technique 
in order to achieve excellence, for example. So uh, the spiritual civilization, the one we are trying to build in Leon Denis' uh, works, is characterized by the acknowledgement of God in all its forms and everywhere. The glory of God, its perfection, and the forms of art have to reflect this deeper reality in a spiritual civilization. The problem is, of course, we do not live in a spiritual civilization. We live in a material uh, world. Uh, we live in a material society and a materialistic society, both in the physical and in the moral sense. So what we now call art uh, is um, very often uh, something instrumental like dancing rhythms or propaganda, things that uh, are exciting for us, that draw our attention uh, because they are colorful and they blink and they are somehow attractive to the senses, but they do not represent any higher idea or the perfection of anything at all. And therefore, we should not consider it art in the proper sense of the word. Uh, it is uh, complete propaganda, and it, it should be uh, enough. It, it should be a, a decent classification for it. It's uh, not Denise's intention to uh, despise that or to say that it has no place whatsoever but to say that uh, it should not be uh, admired and contemplated in museums, for example. Now, what about the artist? What about the responsibility of the artist uh, in face of all this uh, uh, pretty demanding tasks? Well, um, as children of God, we are all and everyone we are all co-creators capable of conceiving beings with a semblance of light, glory and perfection. In order to fulfill such a higher purpose, however, the artist has to be in harmony with all the order of creation and infused by the light of the supreme source of creativity. The artist may not be enslaved by passions and inferior concerns. She or he may not be in conflict with others, but remain righteous despite the struggles of life. Uh, so basically, Leon Denis telling us the artist must be, has to be a stoic. The artist must, must be a wise soul a sort of philosopher, a sort of soul capable of administrating all the uh, multivarious processes of life without uh, losing track of reality. Well, uh, this is very typical uh, Denisian, the idea that in this world, there will always be trouble and chaos, and even though we shall never surrender to the temptation or um, uh, collapse in the face of suffering. We could here give some examples. I'm watching now a TV series about John Adams, an absolutely great uh, character and a great uh, orator. Uh, a master of rhetoric and, and also a sort of philosopher uh, as much as Thomas Jefferson and Benjamin Franklin. And uh, this moment of uh, American history shows us how uh, art can inspire us to greater things and to acts and, and, and forms of behavior that we could not uh, even imagine before uh, being uh, provoked or inspired by them. 
Well, uh, Leon Denis is an author that tells us much about inspiration and sensitivity. A uh, significant part of all his work, all his many books speak about inspiration and sensitivity and a sort of fine perception of the divine, of uh, higher spirituality, of the, the depth of life. And uh, just as an example, as an illustrative example, in his book, The Invisible, then he speaks about the glorious mediumship. What exactly is glorious mediumship for Denis? Uh, it is the mediumship of the missionaries, of the greatest heroes of mankind, thus uh, who somehow influenced all humanity and uh, produced something good or developed or improve the well-being consciousness of the entire humanity. Of course, he's speaking about Beethoven, about Michelangelo, about uh, Buddha and, and Jesus, Socrates, Plato and Aristotle, about Dante and, and Shakespeare, about those who achieved such a, a higher state of inspiration that they could actually see permanent things and produce permanent works of art that will never pass. And uh, after 300 years, uh, we still uh, praise uh, Bach, Sebastian Bach songs uh, and, and music as a supreme form of art, maybe the highest form of music ever produced and in the next 500 or 5000 years we are pretty sure that it's going to be so uh, as much as we admire and we praise Homer or Sophocles or Cicero or Dante after thousands of years or hundreds of years because they are not talking to the public, they are not talking to the time, they are talking to the immortal part in us, to our spirit. And so these works are immortal in a non-social sense of the word. As observed by the philosopher Immanuel Kant, who invested some of his time describing aesthetics and trying to explain aesthetics, and the aesthetic feeling. Art is a, a meeting point or a match point between nature and mind. It is always material. We always use tools and instruments or uh, we uh, act upon material objects uh, such as marble, marble or uh, canvas. Um, but it is also subjective. It is a product of our minds, of our feelings, of our intentions. So it is a human way, a spiritual way to capture and reproduce in the material world what is essentially true. How should we behave in practice? How should spiritualists of all sorts, or spiritists, behave in the face of such very deep and very serious concepts of beauty and art? Well, we have to be more familiar with the greatest, a very good point to start. We should not believe that it is our task, it is our role to recreate artistic tradition or the history of the arts in a, a spiritist or in a spiritualist way. Uh, it is not so because this greatest, uh, the, 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 the greatest uh, artists, they are um, not Christians or, or Muslim. They're not Hindu or atheists. They are uh, very sensitive, inspired, wise souls communicating 
something divine, something eternal to us. So it is necessary to educate our generation to appreciate Homer and Dante, Shakespeare and Goethe, Beethoven and Michelangelo. We have to do this again. We have to uh, emphasize the best that humanity created, the best that humanity achieved, because it is the best way to awaken the soul to uh, these eternal forms. Well, uh, Leon Denis, therefore, does not recommend us to link uh, beauty and God only. He stressed that beauty is God, it is the appearance of God, and whoever sees, sees beauty uh, anywhere is actually seeing uh, the face of God or the light of God through that thing. Of course, some forms are more appropriate to allow this light of God to pass through them, and some forms are not that appropriate, but uh, basically uh, it is a shift or a change in our own eyes, in our own hearts and souls that will permit us to understand the world in a more aesthetical way and to see beauty everywhere. I would like to leave you with this uh, part of uh, the Ninth uh, Symphony of Beethoven when uh, he reproducing Schiller's poem uh, in uh, musical form uh, tells us, uh, as we may remember, uh, Freude, schöner Gotter Funken, Tochter aus Elysium. Uh, joy, you uh, beautiful sparkle of God, you beautiful divine sparkle, uh, daughter of Elysium, daughter of Elysium, uh, we enter you, or joy, uh, drunk with fire or inebriated with fire, uh, and uh, we enter thus inebriated in the heavenly uh, or in your heavenly sacredness. Uh, it is not uh, without sense, uh, without motive, that it is now considered the inn of uh, Europe. Uh, it is a very beautiful song, very beautiful poem that uh, really inspires us and an example of a form of art that uh, draws our attention to the higher part of ourselves the higher part of uh, reality. It draws our attention to, to God and the divine. Thank you so much for your patience. Are you okay. there? Thank you. Thank you so much. So I was trying to find the right button there. Uh, Umberto, what a fantastic talk. Thank you so much for providing that to explain about Leon Denis' view of art and how that affects us within Spiritism. And you mentioned there about Beethoven's Ninth Symphony. That's actually one of my favorites. It's uh, fantastic. There are some great versions out there, both instrumental and obviously with the choir. Um, when you hear a great choral version, when it just kicks in, it's a fantastic piece. Oh, you're on mute. Let me just unmute you. No, nope. you're on mute. <laughs> I actually plan to sing it, but in the last moment, I realized that it would be insanity. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was going to come on singing it myself, but then I thought, no, perhaps not. <laughs> so, um, so before we come to any questions, let's just go to some announcements on behalf of bus. Uh, let me just bring them up just for a moment. So there we go. Um, 
So just on behalf of BUS, there's a couple of announcements to give. Uh, coming up in April, on Sunday the 18th of April at 11am, uh, Jocka Dalidoni will be talking about the Medium's book, celebrating 160 years of this fantastic piece of work from Alan Kardec. Uh, next Thursday, on the 8th of April, there will also be another live part of the Spiritual Light series of talks with Charles Kempf, Elsa Rossi, Nadja Giesis and Stephen Bertozzo, most of whom are watching with us today. Thank you for being with us. Another announcement is that every two weeks, for those of you who haven't seen this, the Spiritist Society of Bournemouth and the Pooled Christian Spiritualist Church are hosting a series of talks looking at the psychological series of the spirit Joanna G. Angelis. You can easily go to their events on YouTube and Facebook, and they are really good events, so please tune in when you can. And another exciting thing is the next episode episode two of Kardec Group's podcast insightfully speaking will be launching very soon on YouTube plus all the main podcast stations looking ahead to May the next Leon Denis talk will be with Roberto Watanabe on Saturday the 1st of May where he'll be talking about the problem of love and destiny and, of course, on the 22nd of May, there will be the 8th British Congress on Medicine and Spirituality, Health, from the, Health for the Third Millennium, with Dr. Peter Fenwick, Alexandra Moreira, Tanya Stevanin, Natalie Tolber, Vanessa Ansloni, and Sonia Doy. And that is obviously created by AMI International, BAS, and the British Spiritist Medical Association. And you can get more information about all of these and other events from the BUS website and Facebook pages. So, let's go to see who has been saying hello and what questions there are. Um, so, we want to say hello to... Ah, lots of people. Elsa, Val, Juliana, Miguel, Marcella, Mariana, Maria, Mark. Kingush, Leah, Elsa Lee, Stephen, Maria Claudia, Leandro, Antonio, Florenzo Anton, who's with us. Thank you for being with us. Edgier, our good friend over there. And hello to all those in London, Dublin, Oxford, Stockholm, Lithuania, Fortaleza, Bournemouth, everywhere around the UK, Brazil, and beyond. Thank you for being with us. So we do have a couple of questions here. We have one from Elsa, who asks, Art is one of the best ways to spread Spiritist philosophy teachings to youth. Why do most of the Spiritist institutions not priorities, prioritize these areas? Very good point, Elsa. Um, I will give you my opinion, my humble opinion about this. I think that uh, first, uh, the, the primary problem is that we do not read Leon Denis anymore. <laughs> this is a reality. It is something that we are trying to uh, to mend or to, to uh, heal uh, in the social aspect of the spiritist movement. Uh, the fact that we do not read uh, our classics anymore. Uh, if we did so, we would realize that uh, art and, and beauty actually are central parts of uh, our existence, of our spiritual lives, and therefore we cannot ignore it and we cannot, uh, in our events, as uh, many leaders uh, unfortunately do, consider this a sort of uh, side dish to fill the gaps between uh, more serious activities, which are, of course, speeches. I'm, I'm, I'm talking about the speeches. We, we are pretty um, speech-centered, and uh, we are pretty much uh, focused on the idea of uh, understanding, of clarification, or 
even inspiration through words, but not so much in a, a, an artistic way. Well, um, on the other hand, we could also see that we have the art of oratory in the spiritist movement uh, quite a lot, and, and it is quite present in our reality. Uh, we have many uh, extraordinary speakers, and we have many speakers that are masters uh, of, of the world, masters of the voice modulation, and they are uh, as, as good artists as everyone who uh, delights the public, but uh, not always these popular speakers are also very learned in the spiritist philosophy as well. So <laughs> it is important not to overemphasize the artistic part of the speeches. Uh, a good form of not overemphasizing the artistic uh, part of the speech is uh, to have more emphasis on art itself. And I think that if we had more music and more poetry and more literature, more uh, very uh, high quality uh, literature, we would not feel the need of uh, aesthetical fulfillment that much in the middle of our public sessions, which uh, are destined primarily to uh, consolation or to improve uh, the understanding uh, of the hearers. Yeah. What's your thought on things like music therapy within centers because this is something that we've seen especially in brazil you go to a center and they may have a session of music therapy it does make sense as long as we have a, a spiritual or spiritualistic perspective of the world of life so it would make less sense if we think as many artists and many people nowadays believe that art is a random invention of human creativity and you can pretty much make up everything uh, and uh, there is no more um, uh, criteria for beauty than taste and taste is random or culturally, subjectively, relative, and so on and so on. It's pretty much the materialistic perspective about art and, and beauty. Now, if we have uh, standard uh, and, and permanent uh, standards and, and uh, permanent values that guide uh, the criteria of beauty and art, then we can uh, separate and discern good art from bad art. It is not actually so hard to do. <laughs> it's something that we, we do almost instinctively if we are not corrupted by uh, these relativistic ideas about art as just everything that you want to do. And uh, once we uh, understand or once we at least believe that there is intrinsic good in beauty and in art it makes a lot of sense to link this intrinsic value this intrinsic good or this intrinsic virtue to uh, pretty much any other virtue or, or uh, value, including health or mental health or well-being in, in general or, uh, uh, or joy or happiness and so yeah. on. So following on from that, uh, our good friend Fabrice Dunn in Bournemouth has given this question. There are many physical and psychological therapies managed through the arts. Does Leon Denis mention anything regarding how art can heal the soul? I think this is directly linked uh, with the formal consideration about the essential and the uh, 
even natural or superhuman value of beauty. If we do believe or if we see that beauty is something uh, related to the higher order of things, the, the best forms and the best ways uh, of every and each thing or phenomena, well, uh, it, it, it's pretty logical and uh, even necessary to consider that we should want and we should uh, work uh, to be surrounded by beauty, to, to, to have more aesthetical lives, to have uh, more contemplative lives, uh, and uh, that we should uh, at least try to surround ourselves with uh, the goodness represented by uh, beautiful things, be they natural or uh, be they artistic or man-made beauties. Yeah, and there, there's obviously the great expression, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. And one thing that a few people commented on is that there's a wonderful amount of beautiful bird song coming from behind you during your talk. And <laughs> this is one of the great things about when talk to someone who's especially close to nature, with nature in the back garden, you can hear these wonderful birds all the time. Yeah, exactly, it's, it's permanent, and it's something that uh, in, in roots in our soul in an unconscious uh, way. And C.S. Lewis was a great intellectual, one of the greatest uh, Christian writers of the 20th century. In his abolition of men, I believe, he said uh, a lot against the idea that beauty is in the eyes of the beholder. Uh, of course, um, in a positive sense, it is. We choose to see beauty or ugliness, but uh, there is also intrinsic beauty in, in the forms. So there is intrinsic beauty in health, there is intrinsic uh, beauty in justice, there is intrinsic beauty in, in joy or in faith or in, in sacrifice, in, uh, in duty, in, in performing one's duty. And uh, Plato and also all the, the classical uh, the, the admirers of the classical concept of beauty, as Leon Denis and, and Kardec are, uh, Plato is always trying to show us that whatever we call good, we can also call beautiful. And I think this is a, a very good way to keep track of the reality and, and the more objective uh, manifestation of beauty. Uh, of course, at the same time, uh, as a parallel process, we have the subjective uh, interpretation of the world and our moods and our philosophies uh, do affect the way we capture or apprehend this beauty. And if you're pessimistic or if you're always upset with everything, as some people enjoy uh, being and, 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 and doing, then uh, you can um, ignore beauty where it is and see ugliness where it's not. Yeah, and you mentioned before about rereading people like Homer and Shakespeare, etc. I know. If you, try, if you can get through the Iliad and the Odyssey, then congratulations to you. They're fantastic books, but they do take a while. Um, but they are worth, they're definitely worth rereading all of these things, all of the old classic artwork. Um, even though we're here in this pandemic, we have the opportunity to go and visit museums online. The Louvre has a virtual walkthrough of the galleries. Other other museums as well. So I think everyone should take time to switch off from things that we don't need and remind ourselves of all these beautiful things that we used to admire so much 10, 15, 20 years ago. 
So I think we're coming to the end now. Umberto, do you have any last reflections? Well, I'm, I'm happy with, with what we studied today. Um, I apologize for any lack of uh, competence, uh, especially in language. Uh, and uh, for this, I again, thank you for your patience. No, thank you so much. And that's all there is for me to do now, just to say thank you so much to our friend Umberto Schubert for being with us today, to thank all of you guys who have been watching us, to thank BUS for organising this event, to thank the Irish Spiritus Federation, Kardec Radio, Kardec Group for transmitting this event. And we just want to say a big thank you to all of you for, to ask for that you keep well, you keep safe, and that we'll be back again on the 1st of May 2021 with Roberto Watanabe, who'll be talking about the problem of life and destiny. So please take care, and we will see you all again very soon. <laughs>